Hello you absolute legends. Well, that really didn't take long. Three weeks after the game's release, Doom Eternal has been completely demolished. Speedrunners have managed to beat the entire game in less than 30 minutes. If you've had a chance to play Eternal, you'll know how insane that is. The game is simply massive. In February, I predicted that Eternal would not be broken in the same way that Doom 2016 was, and in a way, I was correct. A lot of the techniques and skips used in 2016 are no longer used in Eternal. But in another, more relevant way, I couldn't have been more wrong. Doom Eternal's speedrunning is extremely broken, with players flying through the air, glitching through barriers, and seamlessly navigating their way through out-of-bounds sections. It is legitimately crazy how much has been discovered in such a short amount of time. It's one thing to find a new glitch or exploit, but it is a different story entirely to find meaningful ways to implement those glitches in a manner that is useful. Some of these strategies that have already been worked out will blow your mind, and the fact that they were figured out in a matter of weeks is extremely impressive. Even if glitched runs aren't your cup of tea, understanding what these exploits are and how they work is still really interesting. In saying that, there is a case to be made that the main exploit Eternal speedrunners use isn't even a glitch, but rather an unintended emergent property of some of the game's mechanics. In this video, we are going to break down the main technique that speedrunners abuse in their speedruns. And by the end of it, you should have a pretty good understanding about what's going on and why it works the way that it does. We will also take a look at a very special secret room that was never intended to be found by the programmers, but has been uncovered and used by speedrunners to beat one of the levels quickly. I will also do my best to avoid any spoilers, and I won't be covering any of the later stages. So sit back and relax as we explore the broken world of Doom Eternal speedrunning. Now before we go on, this video is sponsored by NordVPN, and I'm going to quickly show you what I use NordVPN for. So last week I wanted to watch Snatch. It's an epic movie and I hadn't seen it for a while, so I searched Netflix and of course it's not there. But there is still hope. I did a quick Google search to see which countries had Snatch on Netflix, and lo and behold, it's available in the UK and Canada. So I quickly connected to the Canadian server through NordVPN, refreshed the page, and there it is, in all its glory. I'm already paying around $13 for my Netflix subscription, so for just a few dollars more I'm getting access to way, way more content. The speed through NordVPN is extremely quick, so I've never noticed any buffering or stuttering. This one feature alone is more than worth the cost. But of course, a VPN is useful in a ton of different scenarios. Whenever I'm using peer-to-peer -peer services, I use a VPN. Whenever I want to access certain websites through a particular region, I use NordVPN. It's very cheap, and of course, they have a 30-day money-back guarantee. So if you can't find a use for it, just let them know. So click on the link in the description or go to nordvpn.com slash carljobs for 70% off, plus a month free. Now back to the video. When I first played Doom Eternal, I was shocked at how large each stage is. Completing a single level usually took me at least an hour, involving tons of problem solving, platforming, and combat set pieces. I figured that due to the massive amount of distance the Slayer had to cover, it would be much harder to find the kinds of skips we saw in Doom 2016. Skips where we go from essentially the beginning of the level all the way to the very end. But what I couldn't have predicted was that there was a single unintended mechanic, a single exploit, that would blow the game wide open, and allow players to skip almost every section of each map. This exploit is called slope boosting, and runners use it to fly to insane heights and cover great distances. In order to understand why slope boosting works, there are a few key mechanics that we need to unpack. Slope boosting is not the result of a glitch or a breakdown of the game's code, but rather the direct result of several intended mechanics coming together in a way that produces a crazy outcome. With Doom Eternal, we saw an increased focus on platforming. Id Software had created obstacle courses that required precisely timed jumps between platforms and climbable walls. Platforming in a first-person shooter isn't exactly an intuitive thing, and one of the key reasons for this is the fact that you can't see your feet. We can deduce a lot from what we see, but trying to jump from the edge of a platform without seeing where you're standing, or even the edge itself, is pretty tricky. In the third-person perspective that standard platformers use, we get to see everything clearly, enabling us to time things to perfection. In Doom Eternal, the first-person perspective adds yet another layer of difficulty. 
Id Software were obviously well aware of this challenge, and given the level of precision some of the obstacles required, they decided to program some added leeway into the game. This leeway is coded into the game via a value called Jump Extension. Jump Extension is a field that extends out from all physical surfaces, and as long as you are located within this field, you'll still be able to perform a normal jump, even if you aren't standing on solid ground. In order to understand why this helps, we first need to understand how jumps work in Doom. The Slayer has two jumps he can perform, a normal jump and a double jump. These two jumps are similar, but the double jump has slightly less upwards velocity, meaning that you won't get as much height when it's performed. Once the Slayer has done his double jump, he won't be able to jump again until he either touches the ground or interacts with an object that will reset his double jump, for example a monkey bar. In practice we're all well aware of how double jumps work, but how the game determines which jump to use is useful to know. Whenever you attempt to jump, the game will perform a few checks to see what jump to use. The first thing the game will check is if you are standing on solid ground. If you are, it will perform a normal jump. If you aren't standing on solid ground, i.e. you're in the air, the game will check to see if you've already performed a double jump. If you have, no jump will be performed. If you're in mid-air and haven't performed a double jump, the game will check to see if you're inside of a jump extension area. If you are, the game will perform a normal jump. If you aren't, the game will perform a double jump. Now that we know how jumps are decided, we can understand why jump extension is such a valuable addition. This gives the Slayer the ability to perform a normal jump even if they are late on their timing and attempt to jump when they have already left the edge of a platform. If this jump extension field didn't exist, as soon as you ran off a ledge and tried to jump, you would perform a double jump, drastically reducing the amount of distance you can cover. Jump extension gives you a much greater window in which to time your first jump. The exact dimensions for jump extension are 3 meters across, 1 meter down, and 0.5 meters up from all surfaces on which you can stand. There is one very important aspect to understand about jump extension. We know that the game will first check to see if you performed a double jump already, and then if you haven't, it will check if you're within the jump extension range. If you are, it will perform your normal jump. But it doesn't check to see if you've already performed a normal jump. This means that in theory, if you were to create jump inputs quick enough and could create multiple inputs while still inside the jump extension range, the game will indeed make the Slayer attempt to perform a normal jump for each input created. This fact alone won't lead to crazy jump velocities though, as the game does not normally stack jump velocities. Every time you jump, the game sets your upward speed to a set value. So it doesn't matter how many times you jump, each jump will result in the same value. But there is one instance where your upward velocity does stack, and that is when standing on a ramp. Doom Eternal has a built-in mechanic called ramp jumping. Whenever the Slayer is standing on solid ground, the game will check the angle of the ground, and if the slope is greater than 9 degrees, it will flag the ground as a ramp, and automatically enable the ramp jumping mechanic. Ramp jumping changes the way the upwards velocity of a jump is calculated. As I mentioned before, usually when you jump, your upwards velocity is changed to a set value, but this can cause some issues when you're running up slopes. In the real world, upwards velocity is added to your velocity when you jump. This is why a skateboarder will get extra height when ollieing off a ramp. If Doom didn't factor this in, it would feel extremely weird when jumping while running up a ramp. The game wouldn't consider your upwards momentum, and it would feel like you were sticking to the ramp, instead of taking advantage of it. In order to make jumping from ramps feel more realistic, they programmed jumps to stack with your current upwards velocity. So the final value of your upward speed would be the set value that is always given when you jump, plus your current upwards velocity. It is precisely this stacking of upwards momentum, combined with the lack of a jump cooldown in jump extension areas, that enables you to produce massive upwards speeds. Every time you jump, your upwards velocity will increase, as it takes into account the momentum gained from the previous jump. Now that we understand the underlying mechanics, how can we exploit them to our maximum advantage? The first thing we need to do is figure out the quickest way to input multiple jump commands. The jump extension area is very small, stretching only about 0.5 meters above the ground. Given that your upwards velocity will increase so quickly, it's going to be very hard to get a lot of inputs in before you're too high. The quickest way to repeatedly give the same input is by using the mouse scroll wheel. Free scrolling wheels can produce hundreds of inputs per second. Speedrunners already took advantage of this in Doom 2016 and bound the jump command to scroll down on the mouse. 
However, there was a very peculiar change between Doom 2016 and Doom Eternal in regards to this. In Doom 2016, you could bind a jump to the scroll wheel in the menu. In Doom Eternal, you can bind any other action to mouse scrolling, except for jumping. This leads us to believe that the developers knew about the possibility of exploiting jump extension on ramps and were actively trying to prevent people from doing it. But they forgot to disable the ability to bind jump to the scroll wheel via console commands, so we can still do it. It is also imperative to increase the game's frame rate as much as possible. More frames per second allows us to create more inputs per second. Eternal has been designed to accommodate insane FPS, all the way up to a thousand. However, this does create massive advantages to those with better computers. In order to even the playing field and allow more people to compete, the frame rate must be limited to 250 if you want to submit a speedrun. 250 FPS is still pretty high though, and most runners will need to lower their in-game video settings as much as they can in order to reach this benchmark. Without frame rate high and the jump command bound to the scroll wheel, we can now take full advantage of slope boosting. In order to see the effects, all you have to do is stand on a slope, scroll down on the mouse wheel, and watch the Slayer shoot up at a rapid speed. As impressive as this jump is though, it's still nowhere near as extreme as some of the boosts we see in speedruns. One way to get even more height is to slow down time using the weapon wheel. Whenever the weapon wheel is brought up, the game runs in super slow motion. But as the frame rate is still high, this means that we can input even more jump commands in a shorter period of time. This gives us a noticeable boost in height, but again, it's not as insane as some of the jumps we see in speedruns. In order to get maximum height, we need to take advantage of ledges. Ledges in Doom Eternal work in interesting ways. Despite most of them being a join of two flat surfaces, the edge those two surfaces produce is not actually a square corner. An algorithm in the game's code artificially smooths out the corners, so instead of producing a 90 degree sharp edge, it produces a curved slope that connects the two surfaces. In essence, it creates a ramp. When the Slayer is standing on an edge, the game recognizes this as a ramp, and therefore activates the ramp jumping mechanic. The great thing about using ledges for slope boosts is that we can use the extra meter of jump extension that extends downwards by falling down slightly before spamming jump. Now, instead of 0.5 meters of jump extension, we can use the full 1.5 meters. This enables us to get maximum upwards velocity, allowing us to reach extreme heights. Now that we understand why slope boosting works, let's see how it plays out in Eternal's first level, Hell on Earth. For reference, in the current speedruns for completing Eternal without using any of these exploits, it takes around 7 minutes to complete. With slope boosting, we can finish it in just over a minute. After clearing the first room, we make our way through the next section to get the first weapon mod upgrade. This is important because even though a lot of combat is skipped, there is still a surprising amount of combat left in the run, so getting the sticky grenades for the shotgun makes combat way faster. Now we head back to the first stairs we encountered and perform a slope boost to jump through the roof and get out of bounds. Behind the starting room is a ledge we can use to make the jump to the end of the stage. But we can't just do a single jump. Even though we can get a lot of height, slope boosts don't necessarily provide a lot of horizontal speed, therefore we couldn't make the distance. So we're going to have to perform two jumps, the first to get height, and the second is used to convert our kinetic energy into horizontal speed. Because the jump is so large, we will need the weapon wheel to slow time so we can stack more jumps. The first jump is used purely to get height, but shortly after reaching the peak of the jump, we inch ever so slightly back inwards towards the ledge. We need to land on the slope of the edge in a very precise position so that when we land we bounce off, turning that downward speed into horizontal speed. Just before we land, we activate the weapon wheel and spam jump. The jumps we spam with the wheel also get us the extra height we need to make the distance. If everything was done correctly, we'll have enough height and speed to make it all the way to the final room where the level ends. Well, it took me an entire video to explain slope boosting, so what I'll have to do is explain the rest of the techniques in a future video if you're interested in learning more. There is one more thing though I have to cover here, which is the discovery of a secret room in the Mars Core stage. This room was never intended to be accessible in normal play, and can only be reached by using a series of advanced maneuvers. In the current world record strategy, the ballista is first used to get enough height to climb onto the roof. A slope boost is then used to make the jump to the room. More ballista shots are done mid-air to provide enough horizontal speed to reach the room. Switching weapons back and forth allows for faster ballista shots. Inside the room, a single BFG is available for pickup. 
and the walls are lined with teleports leading to different sections of the stage. It seems like this was used by the developers to quickly access specific areas for testing. Interestingly, this appears to be the only level where a room like this exists. Either Mars Core is unique and was the only stage this type of teleportation system was used, or similar rooms were used and subsequently removed by the developers on other levels. Perhaps this room was overlooked and they forgot to remove it. In any case, this is really cool to see a fingerprint of the designers inside a game like this. Anyways guys, I plan to do more videos in the near future covering more Doom Eternal mechanics. There are a ton of other cool discoveries I didn't have time to cover here, but I'm really enjoying learning about this game and can't wait to share what's happening in Doom Eternal. Keep in mind that speedruns that use glitches and skip major sections of the game are only one category of speedruns. If glitches and exploits aren't your thing, there are also some glitchless runs that I want to cover in the next couple of months as well. If you want to see some crazy top-level standard play without exploits, I recommend watching the 100% Ultra Nightmare run. The current record stands at 3 hours and 28 minutes by Dracu. I'll put a link to it in the description. I will also put a link to the current Any% percent record, which showcases slope boosting in all its glory, which is currently held by Zemide. If you liked this video and want to see more Doom Eternal explanations, be sure to subscribe for future videos. A huge thanks to the guys in the Doom Eternal speedrunning Discord for helping me learn about this game. I will put a link to their Discord in the description if you want to give speedrunning a go. Thanks for watching you legends, I hope you are having a fantastic day, and I will see you in the next video.